Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to a very early morning uh, tour today. This, I believe, is our eighth uh, virtual tour, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, we're going to do railroads today. Railroads is represented by people here in Oakwood. Um, it is a regular tour that we give, and I like it because, A, I like the stories. They're somewhat gruesome, some of them, but... Um, I also uh, think that it underscores the importance that railroads have been to the life of this state, this city, and this area, um, especially after the Civil War. Now, you've already met Albert Johnson, the first uh, engine, the, the engineer who drove the first locomotive into Raleigh in 1840, but now we're talking a half century later. The railroads have come a long way in bad shape after the Civil War, but, but after the war, a time of great renewal of railroads, great expansion of railroads, small roads at first, consolidated into big roads, and made a tremendous difference to every aspect of economic life here in North Carolina at the regional level, state level, county level, the city, Raleigh in the very center of the state, very important to rail lines running north-south as well as east-west, and locally. Locally why? The Oakwood District of Homes was home to many railroad people. Why? Because the rail yards were just west of that. And so it was an easy walk from your house in the Oakwood District to the uh, railroad yards to either help uh, put trains together or uh, switch out uh, a team of, uh, of engineers on a, on a long haul run. So lots of uh, activity here and Oakwood Cemetery reflected a lot of that too for various reasons and we'll talk about some later but know that one reason why Oakwood Cemetery was important here is because of the fatality rate. So many deaths that we have here at Oakwood of railroad people were caused by the railroad. If there were a way for the railroads to kill you the people in Oakwood found it, and you'll see that as we go through some of their stories here. Not to be intentionally gruesome, but just to tell you just how uh, dangerous it was to work the roads in those days. Now we're going to do this by starting with the executives, first of all, the money men, who put together and managed the railroads. Uh, then we'll switch to the trainmen themselves, from the uh, great romantics, the engineers, uh, right on down to uh, flagmen and so forth. So we'll cover uh, a lot of the history. There's no way we can cover everybody here who has something to do with railroads, um, but we'll do as many as we can. And we're gonna start here with, with uh, the man who is probably the most important executive uh, with railroads. This is Alexander Boyd Andrews. You see just from the size of the stone, it reflects his importance as far as railroading as well as the economy in general. He was from a Henderson, uh, uh, North Carolina, up the line a bit, um, and became in, involved in railroads largely through family connections. He, uh, after the war, went to work with the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad and then a number of smaller lines, but what he's best known for is his heading of the Western North Carolina Railroad. Why? Because it's Andrews who actually developed the line that went all the way across the state to our western boundaries in the mountains. Uh, to Asheville by 1880. By the early uh, 1890s, we, our line, we had a line running all the way to the very ends of the state. In fact, there's a little town named Andrews in the North Carolina mountains that's named for A.B. Um, he had his own private rail car, and that leads me to uh, my favorite story about A.B. Andrews. I'm told by a family member, I said, I will never tell this story until I see it in print. And I've seen it in print, I just can't remember where. Anyway, Andrews, uh, as I said, has his own private rail car that he used to park in the yards over here. Um, and uh, he turned out was friends with President Grover Cleveland. He was having dinner at the White House at one point with Grover Cleveland. He looked a lot like Cleveland. And he suggested to the president, he said, sir, why don't you have a real vacation, where somewhat private, without a lot of publicity? you take my private rail car and head south, do some duck hunting or some fishing, 
And while you're away, I will sit in the rocking chair on the porch of the White House and wave to people as they go by so the tourists will think that they're looking at the President of the United States. And that way you'll have a nice, peaceful vacation. And I gather that's what happened. Um, AB's house stood on, it still does, stands on Blunt Street. It's the last of the big Blunt Street mansions in the 400 block, just up from the governor's mansion, the last of the big mansions to be restored. And as far as I know, it's being restored as we speak. Uh, A.B. Andrews. All right, we're gonna take a walk next door to the uh, Hawkins plot. This way, our cinematographer, Robin Simonton, the director of the cemetery, follow us over. Uh, A.B. was a Hawkins, or related to Hawkins. His mother was a Hawkins. And this is the Hawkins family, another prominent family in North Carolina. And the Hawkins that we're interested in is right here. William Joseph Hawkins, M.D. Trained as a medical doctor, but didn't practice it much. He, like so many other people in the late 19th century, got into business. He was a banker. Uh, but also the president of the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad for some 20 years into the 1870s. Uh, and I think Hawkins was probably the ultimate commuter because even though he had a house in town, in fact, it was right across the street from uh, A.B. Andrews. He could look out his front door into A.B.'s front door at 406, uh, he at 406 Blunt Street. The house is now a parking lot. Um, but he had a family home up in a uh, little town, Ridgeway, North Carolina, up in Warren County, right along the tracks. So he could get on a Raleigh and Gaston train headed north, have it stop at Ridgeway, step off the train, and walk into his front door. The ultimate in, uh, in commuting. William Hawkins. Okay, we've come to the... Uh, to the uh, Beechwood section from the Mordecai section, again, the uh, wonders of virtual touring, um, to another family, very important in uh, Raleigh history, not just for railroading, but the patriarch of the family, John Allison Mills. He's buried on the other side of the family stone, was a railroad man. Not originally, he was born in Holly Springs, what he himself called a dark corner of North Carolina, and he set out to bring light to dark corners of North Carolina with the railroad. Uh, he, uh, a self-made businessman, came to Raleigh in the 1890s, became the president of the Raleigh and Cape Fear Railroad, and he's the one who linked initially Raleigh with the city of Lillington. Now, that was in 1903. Now, that may not sound important, but it was. Why? Because that gave Raleigh direct access to a deep water river. The noose failed as one of those. It was simply too shallow to do uh, any to, to, to do much commerce. But the Cape Fear, again, the, the the railroad between Lillington and Raleigh made a good link to uh, to a port, if you will. We don't think of Lillington as a port, but it was. Uh, and in fact, it was. John Mills, who extended that line to Fayetteville. He's the one who linked Raleigh to uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the road eventually went to the coast, but Mills by then had, uh, had uh, turned his attention to a road in western North Carolina, which didn't make it, in fact. Um, anyway, very important to the life of, of, uh, of Raleigh and the area uh, to this day. Um, my favorite story from the Mills family who keep copious records of their of their work. They tell the story that in the early days, the early trains between Raleigh and some of our small towns like Fuquay uh, were very slow. So that if you saw the ticket taker come in the front of the car, you could go out the back of the car and walk up alongside the train. It was moving so slowly and get back onto the train behind the ticket taker. So it allowed you to avoid having to having to pay your fare at the time anyway so anyway lots of railroad stories uh mills family very important in many aspects of uh, the city of raleigh over the years initiated by john allison
All right, we're in Magnolia Hill now with yet another uh, important executive. This is John Cox Winder and his family. The sun is not good, so I'm going to move over to Robin's left, and she will pan over here. I will tell you about uh, Mr. Winder. He uh, was uh, from Southport, uh, North Carolina originally. He went to West Point and became and joined the U.S. Army uh, after West Point and went west. Uh, his uh, military unit protected the railroad workers as they extended lines to the west. But when the Civil War came along, he resigned his commission and um, became a uh, Confederate soldier. Now, uh, after the war, he moved to Raleigh, and he too, as others that we've seen, became a part of the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad, rose through the ranks. The Raleigh and Gaston, as I, uh, you may remember, became a part of the seaboard airline system, and John Cox Winder became a vice president of the seaboard and an area manager. Now, as such, he had a special responsibility, and we have a graphic for you here. I hope it comes through all right. John Winder's responsibility was to supervise the construction of our railroad station, Union Station, in downtown Raleigh on Nash Square. And this is what it looked like when it opened in 1892. The building is still there. It just doesn't look like this. All the gimcrackery is gone. Of course, it's not a station anymore. It's an it's a office building. The, the clock tower is gone, but this is now the site of fire engine station number one. So that gives you a little bit of uh, orientation here. Now, a, a nice looking station, uh, but it had a problem that eventually led to its demise. Why? It was a stub end station, not a pass through station. That means the trains had to back into the station to unload and load passengers. Well, that was okay when the trains were short and local, but when the trains became longer and some of them express trains that ran from New York to Florida, that became a real problem because the railroads were not going to stop and back in to this station. So they bypassed Raleigh. Though you could make special arrangements to be picked up in the rail yard if you were going north or south, you wouldn't be doing it at the station. It was not until 1942 when the seaboard opened the, their pass-through station, which you now know off of uh, Peace Street, that um, uh, we resolved that problem and lost what was an awful nice looking railroad station. Anyway, John Cox Winder, very important in its creation. All right, we're in the Anderson section now. Uh, we've seen some railroad executives and many people associated with railroads in the early days, many money men were, I wouldn't call railroad men. They were in it for something else. They were in it for the gain. They were in it for the cash, I suspect. And I think uh, Falconer uh, Arendel probably falls in that category. He, uh, he was he held a variety of jobs uh, during his time in Raleigh, including he headed the state prison for a time, which was a political or patronage appointment. Um, and he worked for the News Observer. He was a good friend of Josephus Daniels. But he became associated with the Raleigh and Pamlico Railroad, another one of these small railroads, this one intending to go from Raleigh to Washington, North Carolina. Now understand these roads needed stopping places along the way that might not have existed before the railroad came along. It was not only to take on and let off passengers and, and freight, it was also to water up the locomotive and to check with the station master or the telegrapher to see if there was anything they needed to know about what was going on further down the line. So it's important that they have these stops along the way and towns popped up that didn't exist until the railroads came along. Zebulon, North Carolina was one of those towns. I suppose coming from Raleigh, uh, it would have been one of the first stops. And it was Falconer Arendo who helped to lay out the plan of Zebulon, North Carolina, the town. And he, he was not a shy man. Who did he name the, the Main Street for? If you're from Zebulon, you know, Arendo Street. And here he is, um, Benjamin. A falconer, I should say, a, a, uh, an unusual first name, uh, Arendel 
one of the founders of Zebulun. All right, we're in Magnolia Hill now, and we're finished with our railroad executive types. And guess who we're going to talk about next? The trainmen, the people who actually ran the train, because Oakwood Cemetery is full of them. And we're going to start with the, what I call the romantics of railroading, and that would be the engineers. And we have with us, we're standing right here at the man I would call the king of Oakwood locomotive engineers, Joe Heilig. Joe Heilig began on a farm, but he was attracted to railroads like so many young men, became a fireman on a, a railroad line and rose through the ranks to become an engineer. Not just any engineer, he was called the speediest engineer uh, on the seaboard airline by the newspapers. Why did they like uh, engineer Heilig? Because he broke so many speed records and they would write him up. Uh, I think his most famous in the 1890s, I want to say 96, I may be off there. He ran from Raleigh to Portsmouth, Virginia, 78 miles in 72 minutes. And it was so fast, you do the math in your head, that uh, the manufacturer of his locomotive, and I think it was from Richmond, sent him a gold watch. So not only did he get good publicity, but he got a gold watch out of it. And that wasn't his only speed record. He set other records that subsequent people tried to break, and it took a long time to break them. Um, now, you're going to see that the casualty rate among locomotive engineers was pretty high, but not Joe Heilig. It isn't as though he wasn't in wrecks. We know of at least two wrecks. He ran a 14-car train off the tracks in Cameron, North Carolina, jumped clear. It was not blamed on him. The switch was misset or something in the tracks. Another one up near Henderson is described as his locomotive running headfirst into a locomotive that was a sort of a service train, railroad people out working on the tracks. It's described as both locomotives meeting headfirst and going straight up in the air with their noses. Heilig again jumped clear and he survived that one too. He actually lived to retire and he must have done well for himself because he wound up owning three beautiful homes in the Oakwood District of Homes. So a man who uh, made quite a name for himself. Now note on his stone this symbol. Robin is panning in on it. That stands for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and it was a labor union. Now those of you who know your history are probably raising your eyebrows. A labor union in the South? Yes. The, the BLE was a union that succeeded in a region of the country that didn't like labor unions. Uh, the the uh, Brotherhood was begun during the Civil War in the Midwest and uh, came south with the importance of trains and uh, locomotive engineers. Uh, and the, the uh, Brotherhood would provide various things for engineers like pensions and something else. And we'll see what at least one of those other things was in just a moment. Anyway, we're glad you had a chance to meet uh, Harris Joseph Heilig. Uh, Robin and I have come to the uh, West Branch section and we are standing in what is the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers plot. Yes, the Union uh, purchased this plot and uh, they must have done it so that brothers could would have a place to, to be interred. Uh, again, I think they saw that as a service in the day. However, as far as we know, there's only uh, three, four, perhaps five uh, people in the plot and only three markers. Two of them are engineers, one the wife of Mr. Adams, and there's a engineer Stewart. Both engineers were killed in rather violent train wrecks, um, and thus they are here in Oakwood. Now, why aren't there more here? My own theory, and that's all it is, is a theory. West Branch, in its day when the stream ran down the middle of it, I think was viewed by many as sort of bottom land. And it was the least expensive plots in the cemetery then. That's all changed now that the streams have been uh, uh, tunneled. But, um, and engineers today 
very well paid, it's a very well paid profession, and it's probably true in the old days too. Even though they may not have been paid, they may not have had the highest pay of anyone on that train crew, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, certainly well paid, and perhaps they wanted something uh, on the high ground that had a little more status to it. But uh, that may explain why there aren't, aren't more uh, uh, BLE people down here, uh, but we have no way of knowing. Let's visit some more engineers and hear their stories. All right, we're back in the Anderson plot, right across from the office, in fact. And this is the Faison family. They were surely what one would call a railroad family. This is Rufus Faison. You see he died in 1922, uh, 32 years old, and he worked for the railroad. He was not an engineer, however. He was a flagman, and they had various duties in running, uh, particularly a freight train, but other trains too. Uh, and in those days, uh, to couple and uncouple a car, a box car, the the flagman or the worker actually had to step in between the box cars to work manually the the coupling. Uh, very costly certainly very costly to Rufus. He is not the only one that we have in Oakwood Cemetery who died being crushed between boxcars when they were trying to work the coupling. Uh, it, it, it of course changed over time, but initially again uh, a, a failure of technology in this case. Uh, he's not the only one. His father, and again we have a somewhat of a son problem, William Faison, 10 years earlier, died in, again, rather peculiar circumstances, uh, differed a bit, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment when we move across the cemetery. All right, we've moved uh, directly across the cemetery now to the Pescud section to another engineer, another veteran engineer like William Faison, you see, he was a member of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and thought enough of it to put it on his stone. Uh, the coincidence here is that uh, Cornelius uh, Beckham and William Faison died at the same moment and in the same place. Why? Because each was driving a different locomotive that ran headfirst into each other in a grim day in 1912 up near Norlina, that is on the North Carolina-Virginia line, both veteran uh, engineers on the seaboard making the Jacksonville to New York run, uh, one going south, one going north, some sort of confused signals for sure, and ran headfirst into each other at top speed uh, a catastrophic uh, uh, train wreck killed eight people, not just the two engineers, but uh, porters, uh, firemen, even people in the mailroom on the train uh, died in that wreck. What makes this especially unique, Beckham and Faison, is that they were buried out of the same funeral service at Edenden Street Methodist Church here in Raleigh. Both men laid out at the front of the church, went through the same service. The only difference was in the burials. Beckham came up here, Faison went over to the Anderson section, but again, both the same fate. All right, we've come across the cemetery to the Linden Lawn section. And as you see, uh, or will see, we've moved on from engineers to other people who ran the trains. In this case, John uh, Cates. John Cates was not an engineer, he was a conductor. And you see, he was not a member of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. They had their own labor union, not quite as old as the BLE, but the Order of Railroad Conductors. That's important to understand the role of conductors. Uh, if you're like me, and when you rode trains, you think of the conductor as the guy who comes down the line and takes your ticket. Well, that's a ticket taker, and that may be one function of conductors, but in truth, it was conductors who ran the train. Not physically, 
but they have been called the captains of the train. That's why they're called conductors. Think of conductors leading an orchestra. They're not down there playing a violin. They are leading the whole show. Uh, a conductor on a train has been likened to a captain of a ship. Um, the, the captain of a ship is not the helmsman at the wheel. In the case of a train, that's the engineer. His chief and only job, really, is to steer that train. The conductor is the one who oversees every aspect of the train. It's rolling stock, it's passengers on and off, ticket taking, uh, freight loading, all that sort of thing is the conductor's responsibility. It always struck me as odd that conductors who died in train wrecks were often described as being in the engine cab. What I'm thinking was a conductor doing in the engine cab, why isn't he back there with the passengers taking tickets? It's because <laughs> it was important for him to be in the cab at times, I suspect, to consult with the engineers and so forth. Uh, John Cates, whose stone we're visiting now, is one of those conductors who lost his life in a railroad accident while he was in the cab of the locomotive. Why? The boiler exploded, sprayed him with hot steam that he ingested into his lungs. It uh, made his lungs vulnerable to pneumonia, and he died of pneumonia as a consequence of that train wreck uh, later on. But again, a man who illustrates uh, the role of conductors, which was many faceted, and often it's not just conductors, but other trained people who have all sorts of memory carvings, if you will, on their stones. In fact, if Robin wants to walk around the back of this one, you'll see that John Cates is remembered with sort of another symbol of his, uh, of his uh, railroading. So, um, anyway, uh, this is actually the son, who was also a railroad man, but uh, uh, again, the Cates family, like the Faison family, um, railroad family. All right, we're uh, back in the Pescud section. In fact, Cornelius Beckham is right uh, behind me. This is uh, the, was at one point the Beckham family plot. But we're talking about uh, uh, Jeff the Horton. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that if there was a way for the railroad to kill you, the people in Raleigh found it out, discovered it. And Horton, I think, illustrates that. He was with the Raleigh and Gaston Railroad from the beginning, from the 1840s, and he worked his way up through the ranks of trainmen and became a yard master. That is, he was in charge of the railroad yard uh, that stood to our, our west of here. And uh, that included a warehouse where trains were able to run in and out, at least train cars could run in and out and load and unload. Uh, and he was standing in the doorway of one of those warehouses in the train yard here in Raleigh, and one of the boxcars came in or out, I can't remember which, at a tilt. And just enough of a tilt for it to hit the door frame. It hit the door frame, knocked the door frame out, the ceiling fell in on Jeff the Lord. Um, died, his family bought him this stone, which is one of my favorite stones in Oakwood Cemetery. I want to stop and talk about it just a bit. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the uh, language on it uh, almost goes back to the uh, 17, early 1800s. That last line says, be ye, uh, be ye ready to follow him soon. Be ye ready to follow him soon. Again, that's not a very Victorian sentiment, but a very handsome stone. And if Robin wants to pan down again, we see who carved it, Caton and Wolfe. And yes, once again, you hear us talk about William Oliver Wolfe, the father of author Thomas Wolfe, who was a stone carver here in uh, Raleigh and primarily Oakwood Cemetery during the uh, 1870s, from 1870 to 1880. I love this stone. I think it's his best stone out here. Uh, his, one of his daughters said, the W.O. Wolf was such a skillful stone carver that he could knock out a rose in a matter of minutes. And you see, they really weren't very complicated flowers, but they achieved the effect that you want on a tombstone with a very simple design. And this is the sort of thing I think very wolf-like, pardon the uh, made-up word. But um, 
again, to me anyway, a very attractive stone. In a way, remembering a very unfortunate and unattractive incident, Horton left a wife and four sons. Uh, we're in uh, East Branch now, and uh, Robin is focusing in on a stone a monument to a fellow named Samuel Coley. Uh, he's another yard master, uh, just like uh, Horton, whom we just left, except that Coley was a yard master in Goldsboro. Now, that was a dangerous job because of all the activity in a railroad yard, as you might imagine. But not everybody died of it. In fact, some people, in a way, did okay. Samuel Coley riding around the, uh, the yard at one point. Uh, this was with the Southern Railroad now. Um, he uh, lost his grip as he was riding on a locomotive, fell off the train, and a passing locomotive took his arm off. Uh, he, he survived the accident and took the Southern Railroad to court. He sued them and he won what was then the largest personal injury award in the history of North Carolina. He got $12,500 for that lost arm. Not only did he win the court case, he won the appeal. Um, and $12,500 might not sound a lot like, uh, like a lot, but we're talking now about, uh, for 1900, it, it translates into nearly $400,000 today. So he did okay. Now, that brings up another point though. His attorney, the, uh, the plaintiff, if you will, was a man you know. You've met Thomas Argo here on several occasions, very prominent attorney in, in Raleigh. He's the one who represented Coley, and he's the one who won the case. Um, the fellow who represented the Southern Railroad was someone you've also heard of here. That was Fabius Busby. In fact, he had a retainer with the Southern. It was so common for the railroads to be taken to court because of all the bad things that happened to people riding them that uh, they needed to keep uh, Busby nearby. He lost this case, but I think probably won, uh, won most of them. But the point here is, this is yet another example of railroad-generated dollars percolating through the economy. Both Busby and Argo lived for a time in the Oakwood District of Homes. They made a lot of money off their work with railroad, and they spent that money in Raleigh. So once again, you see all the economic activity that's generated peripheral to railroads uh, uh, along with the railroads themselves, bringing wealth and prosperity, if you will, to the city. All right, we're in the hex section now, and uh, this will be one of our last stops. This is Henry Wilton, and you see we've come a long way from the days of A.B. Andrews and his huge stone, this very simple stone, for a rather tragic figure, but nevertheless one who illustrates railroads. Henry Wilton, was an orphan. Uh, he uh, he was a letter carrier during the presidency of Andrew Jackson. He was an old fellow when he died in his 80s. Uh, he was a widower. His wife died. Um, but somewhere along the line, he went to art school. And what was his occupation? He painted the inside of passenger cars. Now understand, passenger cars in the early days were wooden, at least up until the turn of the last century and when they became a metal and much more comfortable. But in the early days, the soot, the smoke all came into the river, very uncomfortable. Passenger cars unseated, uncooled. It wasn't a fun time to travel on a train. Um, but, but they made the cars look attractive. Nicely varnished, nice woodwork inside with artwork, art decoration around, and that's what Henry did. And once again, another example of um, the trickle down, if you will, of railroad dollars into the economy. Henry, another a, a sad fellow, uh, from, you can tell from his simple stone, uh, never wealthy. In fact, he saved about $400, I think. Uh, and just a few weeks before he died, thieves broke in and stole his life savings. So the poor fellow uh, ended on a very unhappy note. But again, I think he illustrates yet another aspect of railroading. Now, 
and you see that in all sorts of examples. For instance, the North Carolina Car Company here in Raleigh built boxcars. It was a factory uh, over near where the Seaboard Station is now. It was headed by people you know. Robert Hoke was the president for a time. John Cox Winder, whom you met just this morning, uh, was president for a time. And the curious thing, somewhere along the line, they realized that the technology that goes into making boxcars is much the same as there is in making houses. So the Carolina Car Company built, uh, wound up building, a lot, its personnel wound up building a lot of homes in the uh, Oakwood District. Again, another example of this tremendous impact railroads had in ways we might never think of, and that's true of this cemetery. Give us just a few more minutes and we'll show you one we don't think of very often. We are in the Mordecai section now for just a few minutes. This is the stone of George Washington Mordecai, very prominent in Raleigh in his day, the first president of the Raleigh Cemetery Association. And Robin is panning down this very attractive obelisk to a little carving at the base of it. And as she moves in, you see what it says. A. Packy and Sons were the carvers of this, and look where they did it. Baltimore, Maryland. How do you suppose this big stone got here to Raleigh? And we're in the battle section now with the Bryan family, and Robin again is panning a very large stone. And down at the bottom, you see what's carved there. Dratty Brothers Broadway. That would be Broadway, Manhattan, New York. Again, how do you suppose that stone got here? And as we move away from the Bryan family, you see a stone you're familiar with. If you were with us before, you met Bartholomew Figures Moore and his stone done in Philadelphia. Again, you see the impact that uh, uh, railroads had on the artwork that's in Oakwood Cemetery, and it worked both ways. The Cooper brothers, who have lots of carvings here and did the main gate that you came through to get here today, um, also carved stones and shipped them by rail all over the place. So again, railroads having a tremendous impact in any aspect of economic life that you want to consider. Thank you for being with us today.